Hello viewers and subscribers of my channel. In this video, we explain the multi-arm bandit problem. We explain how to approximately or heuristically solve this problem and how to implement the solution in Python. We will be using the epsilon greedy action value method for solving the multi-arm bandit problem. What makes this video interesting is that you will not only learn the basic idea and theoretical concepts behind the multi-arm bandit problem, but you will also learn how to implement the solution method, or better to say epsilon greedy action value methods in Python. That is, you have the whole package, theory, theoretical understanding, and Python implementation. Those of you who follow my channel and my work know by now that I always create a post that nicely summarizes everything that I will explain in this video. And here is the post. The post contains motivational examples, contains graphs, equations, explanation of all the equations, and finally it also contains Python codes. A link to this post is given in the description below this video. Before I start, I would also like to mention the following. It took me a significant amount of time, energy and effort to create this video and the accompanying post. Consequently, I kindly ask you to press the like and subscribe buttons. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's start with motivational examples. The first example is the example of the doctor who needs to select the most effective treatment for his sick patients. Now, let us assume that we are a doctor, and this is us, we are a doctor. And in addition, let us assume that we have three possible treat treatments that we can select. And let these treatments be called actions. So, this is our first treatment, this is action one. Then we have the second treatment, this is the action two. And then we have the third treatment, and this is the action number three. Next, let us assume that every time we apply the same treatment or action, we obtain a different health outcome quantified by numerical value. The health outcome can be, for example, the percentage of the recovery of the patient from the disease or some numerical measure that measures the presence of a virus or cancer in the body of the patient. The variability of the same outcome can be due to the many factors. For example, every patient is different and every person will most likely react differently, even slightly to the same treatment. Even we apply the same treatment or action to the same patient over a time interval, we will most likely obtain different results. If we would have enough data, that is past data, of applying different actions and measuring the patient outcomes, the recovery outcomes, then for every action we can actually construct a probability distribution that can quantify the effectiveness of the treatment or of the action. Now, we call the numerical value of the outcome as the reward. More positive the outcome, that is, more positive reward. That is, if you measure the percentage of the recovery of the patient, let's say 10%, 30%, 40%, then this percentage value can be our reward, and we want to basically maximize this reward. Again, the higher the reward, the more effective the treatment is for a particular patient. Again, assuming that we have enough data, we can construct the probability distributions that you can see over here. So for example, this graph over here shows the distribution of the rewards for the action A1. And we can observe here that the mean is equal to 20. For the treatment A2, of, or for the action A2, this is the probability distribution with the mean, let's say, of 40. And for the action number three, or for A3, we have the probability distribution of rewards that's given over here. So assuming that we know these distributions, then our choice of the most effective action or treatment is relatively easy. 
So stop here for a second and think about what is the best act action over here or what is the best treatment. Okay, so the answer is action number two. And this is because the action number two gives the most effective recovery of the patients. We can see here that the mean is 40. So the mean of reward is 40. So by applying this action, we can get most likely outcome of basically of reward to be around 40. And you can see how the means for other actions are kind of like shifted left to this mean. So if we continuously apply the action A2, we can hope that we can get the best results. That is, we can hope that patients will more positively react to this treatment compared to this treatment or the action one treatment. However, there is one big catch here. We don't know these distributions a priori. So when, say, let's say pharmaceutical company start to design these actions, they don't have past data. They don't have, usually they don't have. And they have to do clinical trials and other experiments. The multi-armed bandit problem is to design a sequence of actions that will maximize the expected total reward over some time period. Also in the literature, this problem is defined as the problem that aims at finding the sequence of actions that will maximize the sum of rewards over a certain time period. Okay, so the idea goes like this. Let us say that we have three possible actions, A1, A2, and A3. Now, at the time step k is equal to 1, since we don't have any data, we need to randomly choose an action. So we can say that our action, capital A1, is equal to, let's say, A3. This subscript here denotes the discrete time instant 1, and over here the lowercase letters are possible actions. And this action will produce certain reward, let's say reward R1. Going back to our example of a doctor that, who wants to design a treatment for patients, basically a doctor randomly chooses an action, finds a patient, applies that action, observed the health outcome, and records that health outcome. Now, the main question is how to select an action for the time step 2. That is, what will be our A2? Will it be A1, will it be A2, or will it be A3? When I mention A1 and A2 and A3, I mean the lowercase letters, that is the actions. So, at the time step two, we either pick up another patient or the same patient after some time interval, and we need to somehow figure out how to determine the proper actions on the basis of our past experience. And here the experience is very limited since we have only tested the action A3. The multi-armed bandit problem aims at finding the sequence of actions that will maximize the sum of rewards over a certain time period. So let us say that at the time step k is equal to 2, capital A2 is equal to action A1. And this action produces the reward R2. Then, at time step k is equal to 3, capital A3 is equal to A1. That is, at a time step 3, we select action 1, and this action produces reward R3. 
then at the time step k is equal to 4, our action is equal to action 2, and this action produces the reward R4. So, the multi-armed bandit, bandit problem aims at finding a sequence of actions that will maximize the sum of rewards over a time period. So, if we continue this process over, let's say, n steps, the solution of the multi-arm bandit problem will minimize this sum, R1 plus R2 plus R3 plus R4 until Rn. Again, as I mentioned previously, in the literature, this problem is also defined as maximizing the expected total reward over some time period. So you can, instead of minimizing or actually maximizing this quantity over here, and let's call this quantity R sum n, an equivalent problem would be to minimize R sum n divided by n. Okay, so this was our first motivational example. So let us briefly go over the second motivational example. And that example is called Casino Gambler. The name of the multi-armed bandit problem is motivated by this problem. Consider a gambler who has a choice to play three slot machines. So we are having a gambler in Las Vegas and he can play three slot machines. A slot machine is usually called a one-armed bandit. And you can see a Wikipedia page over here that shows you an old or vintage one-armed bandit. So this is a quite old machine, maybe 60, 70 years ago. You basically pull this arm and you get some combination of fruits and this combination of fruits give you some points or gives you money or you lose money depending what you do. Usually you lose money in casinos. Now our gambler needs to figure out how to play, let's say, three machines we have such that he or she maximizes the sum of rewards over time period. So we are playing the game and we hope that over time our profit will increase. Now, we assume that every machine produces a different reward outcome every time a lever is pulled or arm is pulled. That is, to every machine, we can again associate a probability distribution that describes the probability of obtaining a certain reward. We assume that our gambler does not know a priori these distributions. Otherwise, his task would be easy. He would take or he would play the machine that has the most favorable outcome, that is, the machine for which the expected value of the outcome is the largest. So the multi arm bandit problem in this case is again to design a sequence of actions, what slot machines to play at certain time steps in order to maximize the total expected reward over a certain time period. Now that we have introduced the multi-arm bandit problem by using several examples, let us see how to tackle this problem. However, let us repeat our problem once more. I'm doing this because I'm following advice of old Latins. So there is an old Latin proverb saying, repetition is mother of knowledge. So the multi-armed bandit problem is to design a sequence of actions that will maximize the expected total reward over some time period. To solve this problem, instead of dealing with distributions caused by certain actions, we need to deal with one number that will somehow quantify the distribution. To explain this, so let us illustrate a typical normal Gaussian distribution. So, it's very difficult to deal with distributions, although there are some statistical methods to deal with distributions. Instead of dealing with distributions, we can somehow deal or compress this distribution to a single number, and that can be 
the expectation or the mean value of this distribution and let this be let's say a mean reward now you're using the expected value or mean values and there are good choices I mentioned for tackling this problem however before explaining how to tackle this problem let us introduce a few definitions the number of arms is denoted by n so we have n arms and we need to find a way how to properly choose them over time in order to maximize the expected total reward over some time period then the action is denoted by ai where i can go from one to n the action ai is actually the selection of one of the arms i so let's say that we have three actions a1 a2 and a3 this action a1 will produce A probability distribution of rewards that will look like this the action a2 can produce a probability distribution that can for example look like this and the action a3 can produce the probability distribution of rewards that can look like this the action selected at the time step k is denoted by capital AK and know that AK is a random variable. What does this mean? It means the following. If at the time step K1 we basically select action A1 capital A1 to be equal to action 1 then the reward will be R1 now let us say that the time step k2 we select a2 to be a1 so again what happens is that we select the same action however this doesn't mean that action at the time step 2 will produce the same reward as in the step k is equal to 1 that is r1 is not necessarily equal to r2 although a1 is equal to a2 this is because we are dealing with distribution so if this is a distribution for a1 and these are the rewards at every time step we are basically randomly selecting a value so if we select a1 the reward can sometimes be here or the rewards can be here but most likely they will basically be around this region okay the action a a k can take different numerical values can take a1 a2 up to a n a numerical value of the action i again is denoted by its lowercase a i Every action AK at the time step K produces a reward that we denote, as I explained previously, by RK. Note that RK, as I explained previously, is a random variable. The expected or the mean reward of the action we take is referred to as the value of that action. So this is very important to understand. The expected or the mean reward of the action we take is referred to as the value of that action. And mathematically speaking, the value is defined as the expectation over RK over the rewards when the action is equal to AI. So what happens over here? We basically have AI action and its corresponding distribution of rewards. The expected value of this distribution of rewards for the action AI is actually our VI and that is our action value, the value of that action, better to say. 
Now, let us go back to our figure 1 from the beginning of this post and let us see what are the values of actions. So here, for the action number 1, the value of the action is 20. For the action number 2, the value of the action is 40. And for the action number 3, the value of action is 30. Now, you can see over here that, ha that I have a one very important comment that I marked in red. And this is very important to remember. If we would know in advance the values of actions, V1, V2, V3, up to Vn, our task would be completed. We would simply select the action that produces the largest value. However, we don't know in advance the values of actions. Consequently, we have to design an algorithm that will learn the most appropriate actions that will minimize the sum of rewards over time. And for that purpose, we will use the action value method. The action values method aims at estimating the values of actions and using these estimates to take proper actions that will maximize the sum of rewards. So the story goes like this. At every time step, we can select any of the actions AI. The action that is selected at the time step is denoted by capital AK. The reward produced by this action is RK. So at a discrete, as the discrete time K progresses, we will obtain a sequence of actions, A1, A2, etc., and a sequence of produced rewards, R1, R2, etc. From this data, we want to estimate a value of every action that, it, that is denoted by vi and that's equal to v of ai. Now, we can estimate these values at the time step k as follows. So here is the formula for estimating the values, the actions, the values of actions at the time step k. So let us explain this formula. Okay, so what do we have over here? The first thing that you need to observe over here that I have a hat, since this is an estimate of the value of action. And the index i is the action number, and k is the time step. So what do I do over here? I basically take R, I, J, and this is basically the reward produced by the action A, I at the time instant J. So what I do over here, I sum all the rewards produced by certain actions. Now, if the action A, I is not selected at this time step J, then the corresponding value over here is equal to zero, and I will explain this in a sequel. Now, n i k is the number of times the action a i is selected before the step k. If this value, that is the value of n i k zero, then we simply set v i k to zero to avoid division with zero issues. So again, what do we do over here? At a time step k, we take all the actions produced by the, actually all the rewards produced by the action i, we sum them, and we divide them by the number of times the particular action ai is selected in the time interval from 1 to 3 until k minus 1. To better explain the formula, let us consider the following example. Let us assume that the time instant is k is equal to 5. And let us assume that we have two actions. We have action A1 and the action A2. Then, let us assume that at the time steps 1, 2, 3, and 4, the actions were A1, A1, A2, and A1. And these actions produce the rewards, the numerical value, values of rewards that are given over here. 
So they are one, two, five, and four. Now, this implies that R11 is equal to one. So, at the time step one, the reward produced by the action one is equal to one. Then we have that R12 is equal to two. We can basically see from over here that at the time instant two, we selected the action one, and here's the index one, and basically the reward is basically equal to two. Then what do we have at the time step three for the action one, for the reward produced by the action one, we can see that at time instant three, we selected A2. Consequently, the reward will be zero over here. What do we, what do we have for R14? That is, what is the reward produced by action one at the time step four? We can see that indeed at the time step four, we selected A1 and we obtained four. Now, how about the second action? What is R21? So at the time step one, we selected action one and we didn't select it. action two, so we have zero over here. How about R22? Again, at time step two, we did not select action two, so we will have zero over here. However, at the time instant three, we have actually selected the action number two, so we have five over here. And at the time instant four, we didn't select the action number two. We, we selected the action number one, so we have zero over here. So what is now our value of the action V1 or the estimate? Be careful here. This is the estimate of the value of the action one we can simply obtain something like this. We obtain one plus two plus zero plus four. I'm basically summing over here the rewards and I need to divide this number by the number of times the action A1 is selected prior to the step five. So it's being selected once, twice, and three times. So over here I have three and I have seven over three, so I obtain basically 2.33. So similarly, an estimate of the value of action two at the time step five is obtained by simply summing these values, zero, or the rewards better to say, zero plus zero plus five plus zero, and we divide this number by the number of times the action A2 is selected prior to the time instant five. It's selected only once, so we have here one, and as the result, we have five. Now, we have to make a few comments about this formula over here. In practice, we usually do not use this formula to estimate the action values. This is because we need to store all rewards obtained before the time step k in order to compute the averages. As the time step progresses, it can become extremely large and it becomes computationally infeasible to store all the rewards. Instead, we use a recursive formula for averages. This formula can be derived as follows. So we can start from our original formula and over here I significantly ease the notation. So I'm just dropping all the indices of actions. You can later on include them. So what happens over here? This sum over here can be written like this basically. And then you can multiply the term over here by k minus two over k minus two. And here you can observe that the part over here is nothing less than an estimate of the action, actually the estimate of the value of the action at a time step k minus one. And if you kind of split this part over here, you take one of the 
minus is over here, you put it over here, and you kind of massage this equation a little bit, you will obtain this formula or the formula given by the equation number five. So what is the obvious advantage of this formula given by equation number five over the formula given by the equation number two? So obviously over here, we only need to memorize the previous estimate of the action value. It's basically k minus one. So we only memorize the estimate of k minus one and we take the reward at the time instant k minus one, we subtract these two values and we obtain the estimate basically for the time step k. And we will use this formula in the Python code that I will explain in the sequel. Now, at a first glance, it might be logical to base our decision on selecting the particular action AI at a time step k on the basis of the following criterion. So what do we do? We have estimates of the action values, right, at the time st step k. Again, we have the estimates of the action value values at a time step k. And what is the best action? The best action is the action that produces the highest estimate in the past. So we are looking in the past and we are selecting the action that has the largest estimate, right? And this approach is often referred to as greedy approach. Again, I will repeat this because this is very important. At every time step k, we are greedy, and we want to select the action that maximizes the past estimate of the action value. This step is also the exploita exploitation step, exploiting something, right? We are exploiting some knowledge in the past. So, we are basically exploiting our past knowledge to gain future gain. However, there are several issues with this approach. One of the issues is that we rely too much on our past experience for making decisions. In our, if our past experience is limited, then our future decisions will be suboptimal. You can, for example, think about the situation. In the first step of the action value method, we randomly select an action and we apply it to our system. Then, we obtain the reward for such an action. Then. Our past experience consists only of one action, and this action gives us the mean reward that we consider as the best reward. And other estimates of the action values are identically zero. Then, for the first step and all other steps, we will just keep on repeating the action from our first initial step. That is, we do not explore other possibilities. This is very important. An alternative and more appropriate approach would be to sometimes, watch out here, sometimes diverge from the greedy selection given by this equation number six. That is to select the actions that are not necessarily optimal and to explore these under quotes suboptimal actions. However, this exploration approach might be rewarding. Why? It will become clear from the future, right? Because currently we think that by just minimizing or actually maximizing or selecting the actions that maximize the past values of our actions, we are doing an appropriate job. However, this might not be the case. So we want to explore other possibilities. So what do we do? With some relatively small probability epsilon, and that's why this whole approach is called epsilon greedy action value method, we deliberately diverge from the selection made by optimizing six. So we say, okay, in most of the cases I will select AK, AK on the basis of this approach. However, sometimes, sometimes, I will diverge, and I will diverge with some probability epsilon. This probability can be 0 0.1 or 0 0.2. So this approach can be implemented as follows. So what do we do? 
we select a real number epsilon larger than zero and smaller than one. So let's say we select epsilon 0 0.1. Then what do we do? We draw a random value P from some uniform distribution 0 to 1. Now, if this value of P, a random variable, is larger than epsilon, we basically minimize the criterion 6. So what do we do? We go back and we actually maximize. I said minimize, I have to correct this in a post. We maximize this criterion. Okay? Now, if probability is smaller than epsilon, then we randomly select an action. So what do we do if P is smaller than epsilon? We simply randomly select any action from this set. We, for example, can select A3, and then we apply this to the system. And then again, we go to the step number two. Two, we actually again draw a random value P from the uniform distribution, and we repeat this procedure. In the sequel, I will explain how to write a Python code that implements and solves the multi-armed Bandit problem by using the epsilon greedy action value method. Moreover, I will teach you how to write a Python code in a disciplined manner such that the code can be re reusable and easily upgraded at a later stage. The basic idea is to write a class, in my case called Bandit Problem, that will implement and solve the multi armed bandit problem by using the epsilon greedy action value methods. Why I'm writing a class? Because in some other parts of your code you can simply initialize and solve the multi-armed bandit problem by simply executing these two code lines. So the code is very compressed, it's very easy to read, and the class implementation is separated from the driver or from the main code. So let us analyze the variables that we need to provide this to this class in order to initialize the problem. We obviously need to provide the true action values. So again, what are the true action values? The true action values are actually the means of the distributions that are created by particular actions. So for example, if I select action one, I need to sample my rewards from a certain distribution and the mean of this distribution is actually an entry of the true action value. So better to say it like this, this that I entry of the true action value that is, the i-th entry of this vector over here that you can see is basically the mean of the distribution corresponding to the action a-i. Then the next parameter that we need to provide to this class is the epsilon value and the third parameter is the total number of steps. That is the total number of simulation steps. Then in this function in it, we initialize the variables. The number of arms is equal to the size of this vector through action values. Then we basically initialize the epsilon value. We set the current step to zero. And we need to basically initialize another variable, or better to say another vector. So this vector, how many times particular arm is selected, is initialized as zeros and the i-th entry of this vector is actually equal to this parameter n i k that is the i-th entry of the vector how many times particular arm is selected is basically equal to the number of times action i is selected prior to the time instant k. So we need to keep track of nik 
and we keep track by defining a, this vector and by updating the entries of this vector in every iteration. Then we set the total steps and here we basically initialize the true action values and we simply say the true action values are equal to the vector provided as an input argument of our class. Then we need another vector and this vector stores mean rewards for every arm. So if we select a particular arm, we will basically obtain some reward by sampling from distributions whose means are defined in this vector and when we get this reward we need to update a mean reward for every arm that is we basically need to update the value over here so the height entry of this vector again to repeat the height entry of this vector is equal to this quantity over here Now, we need another variable that stores the current value of reward, and this variable is called current reward, and we initialize it by zero, and then we need to keep track of the mean reward of the whole problem, and we basically initialize a vector of zeros where we have total steps plus one entries, and this vector will be populated, and later on when we analyze results, we will look into the entries of this vector. Next, we define the function called select actions, and this function basically implements an epsilon greedy approach for solving the problem. So, what do we do over here? We basically first randomly select a number from a uniform distribution defined on the interval of 0 to 1. Now, we analyze this value. If this value is smaller than epsilon, then we perform the exploration step. That is, we don't use the greedy method. This means that we simply randomly select the action. And this index will correspond to the index of the selected action. On the other hand, if the probability is larger than epsilon, then we basically perform a greedy approach we find the index of basically the R mean rewards, the mean rewards that maximizes an estimate. And this is our index corresponding to greedy actions. Then we increase the step value and then we take a record that the particular arm is selected. That is, we simply update this vector over here actually entries this is the entry of the vector and we simply update it over here next we draw from the probability distribution of the selected arm to get the reward so we simply say we simply draw from a normal distribution where the mean corresponds to the mean of the selected basically action that is the mean of the probability distribution for the particular or for the selected action we get the current reward then we update the estimates of the mean reward and we update the estimate of the mean reward for the selected arm and that would be it then we define the function that plays the game so what do we do we introduce a variable i that goes from 0 to the total number of steps and we simply in every step we select actions we simply call this function over here that updates the estimates that selects the random values etc and finally we can write a function that basically resets all the values or sets them to 0 this function can be used if we want to play this game from the beginning, so we need to reinitialize all the values and to set them to zero. Let us now explain how this class can be used in other codes. The first step is to import the necessary libraries. We import the NumPy library, then we import 
the plotting library and from banditproblem.py, that is from this file, we import our class. And over here, I'll just save my code to avoid any problems in the future. Now, the next step is to select the action values that are used to simulate it, to simulate the multi-arm bandit problem. So we select action values as 1, 4, 2, 0, 7, 1, minus 1. We assume that we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 arms. And basically every entry of this vector corresponds to the mean value of the distribution created by a certain action. So for example, over here, for the action number 3, the mean value of the distribution will be 2. And in our class, over here, we basically, so let me just for a second locate where we do that. That is, we do it over here. We basically select a random value of reward from a certain distribution whose mean is actually defined over here. The next step is to select epsilon values. We select different epsilon values to investigate the performance of the method. And you will see later that the performance of the method highly depends on the epsilon value. So we start with a zero, we increment the epsilon values to 0 0.3 with a step of 0 0.1. Then we simulate the problem for 100,000 steps. Then over here, we create four banded problems. Every problem is defined for a certain value of epsilon. Epsilon 1, Epsilon 2, Epsilon 3, and Epsilon 4. And let us execute the code and let's see what will happen. Okay, now I executed the code and obtained this result over here. Notice that basically while doing this, I press the right click and instead basically Clicking over here, I clicked over here. This means that the code executed from here until here. However, I wanted to do something else. I wanted to execute my code from line 1 until line 39. So I will repeat the step. I will erase my workspace. I will also erase the part over here and then I will perform the correct step. So I will select over here and I will do this. It takes some time, it's quite fast on my computer. I actually have a computer that's one year old, so it's a very good computer. On your computer, if you basically have an older computer, it might take 30 seconds to execute these code lines. So let us analyze the results. So let's see what happens over here. For us, the most important variable is the variable that's initialized over here and another variable is the mean reward the mean reward is more important since it tracks the performance of the problem or the solution of the problem for a certain value of the epsilon so what do we need to do we basically need to plot the results so what do we, we will basically plot the mean rewards with respect to time steps for different values of epsilon so let's see what happens over here So here is the result. Here we see on the, in the logarithmic scale our steps and over here we see average rewards obtained for different values of epsilon. You can see the red line, that is the completely greedy approach, does not produce good results. It produces the worst results. The best results are produced for epsilon is equal 0 0.1. We can over here see epsilon 0 0.1 and starts to deteriorate as epsilon increases. And we can see for epsilon 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.3, we obtain this line over here. Let us now briefly analyze the convergence of the solution method for epsilon is equal to 0 0.1. That is, we need to extract the mean reward for the second banded problem. 
and the mean reward is extracted over here. So let me plot this vector, or let me just show this vector in this window over here. We can see that this vector converges to the value of 6.48, so this is the mean reward. And now, going back to our action values, we can see that this mean reward is actually very close to 7, and 7 is actually the maximum value of the action value. That is, we can see that our mean reward converges to the action value for the action 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And this is a good check of the implementation accuracy. Because somehow logic tells us that the best option is always to choose the action number 5. Why? Because the action number 5 will produce the highest action value and this action value is equal to 7 and we can see that our mean reward is close to that value. Now we can do further investigation and we can basically try to see how many times particular actions are selected during the simulation process. We can see that the action 1 is selected 1436 steps and you can see the numbers, numbers of numbers of basically how many times a certain action is being selected during the simulation process. And we can see over here that the action number five is selected 91 times 151. So we can see that most of the times this algorithm selected action number five and action number five corresponds to the largest value of the action value so our algorithm is doing a good job for epsilon is equal 0 0.1 of course in practice you would basically need to simulate this algorithm not for a single realization of action values that i've shown over here but instead you would need to do that by for example writing a for loop and in every for loop over here you will select certain action values and then for this action values you will run the algorithm obtain mean rewards and then repeat this many times and compute the average of the mean rewards to obtain a good insight into the statistical properties of the algorithm okay that would be all for today i hope that you like this video if you like the videos i create Please subscribe and support my channel. Thank you very much and have a nice day.